Yeah, that is the crazy bit. All right, so we're gonna make a new project. Oh, I went to the wrong place though. So the thing that we're gonna be doing here real quick. Create a new file. Um, video one outline. All right, so let's kind of scaffold this out. Let's think about it. All right, probably need to do a title for it too. Um, this is uh, custom hotel integration for next. Right, the general gist is what is Otel, right? You know, could be as brief as we want. Um, right, what is Otel? Why was it made? Who is behind it? Um, list some providers that support it. I think that's a good, all right, we just want like a minute and a half, two minutes, maybe three for that section. I'm gonna say, I bet I can keep it to two minutes. Uh, but, you know, we'll put in some research. Next up, there will be, let's just at least think about this. Um, and really highlight IO full Full stack over. And there's the app router. And really, we're going to be treating this as like almost a little bit of the outline for the process, but the way we do the integration is different. So yeah, um, client instrumentation, server, I, I'm gonna say just client setup, server setup. zoom out a bit. Right, so really like what types of tracing, etc. would we use? Um, yeah, I mean, that's just... I mean, go the speed limit and go with the flow of traffic. That's the way to be safe about it. You know, driving fast and driving slow are actually both almost as dangerous because it's about your interactions with others around you. Whereas if you're going the flow of traffic, you're fine. Right? If you're going so slow that people are forced to like change lanes to get around you, you're actually increasing the amount of like events that can cause problems for a driver, right? The more lane changes you do, statistically, the more chances are you're gonna wreck. Things like that.
I'd love to see some actual like data around that though. That'd be pretty cool. Um, and real quick, so I missed some follows. And Demise, thank you for that follow a little bit ago. Thank you for the sub. Uh, Dev Yaro, thank you for the follow as well. All right, so client setup. Why, right? What does it help you do? I guess maybe the snippet. I guess maybe client setup's trickier on the front end for a custom hotel integration, right? So really, uh, you would need, you know, backend endpoint to consume events. Um, why it was made, who was behind it, providers for it, uh, the moving parts overview, right? So within the moving parts overview, right? The collector, um, right? Let's look at open telemetry in general. Yeah, I like making stuff. So traces, metrics, logs, baggage. No, there's some very advanced people. The Primogen, Theo, nah. DM Mulroy, there's a bunch of very advanced programs. means you haven't checked out enough of them yet. pros than noobs actually i think it's there's a healthy mix tobs right like you know time enjoyed i wouldn't call her an expert i wouldn't necessarily call her a noob she's learning right and that learning journey is actually extremely common on twitch as well right so i think that's the important thing there's all different types of content if you're only familiar with people who are trying to start their career and they're using building in public as a way of keeping their motivation because things like 100 devs encourage them to, yeah, there's a lot of that content out there. But there's also a lot of really technical stuff too. How's week one at the new gig? It's really good. Yeah, for everyone out there that's not aware, I recently started at Get Kraken. As a developer advocate. So yeah, most of this week is doing like onboarding stuff. Sure, depends on the bug prevent. Yeah, another LLM helped us figure out like the midnight issue in some of our code, which was pretty cool. All right, so instrumentation. Right, automatic.
Okay. So yeah, this section thing in this one might actually go to like four minutes. And we could always trim parts that really aren't as important. So then client setup. Let's look at a couple libraries actually. The instrumentation library of libraries. So they don't actually link out? Yeah, they do. Here we go. So yeah, I guess the big thing about client setup is Typically, right? Um, so yeah, the backend endpoint. Relevant client side events. Um, SPA page nav. Um, custom triggers. Button presses. Um, and then exception trace. Right? Those are important parts towards like the client setup. Tying uh, front end errors to a session to help link front end errors and possible back end errors. So then the server setup, that part a little more complicated. So server side tracing, right? This would be the next config. Instrumentation hook. Um, for cell, hotel.
where everyone likes coffee. But I am very cat-like. I got the speed of a cat and reflexes of a mongoose. Throw that spear at me. I dare you. I mean, there's definitely like a quota, man. At some point, you've reached your quota of compliments that matter or mean anything, right? Less is more. So the next config, the instrumentation hook stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's an interesting phrase too. I am a cat person, for sure. Cat in a very specific hat. Okay, yeah, we'll check it out here in a second there, Joanne. I, I want to finish this at least in a little bit of a way. Cool, thank you. Right, so yeah, the next config, Vertel, uh, Vercel specific stuff. So yeah, it ends up basically being a video about this process. And they've got a tutorial about it and everything. So yeah, he already does a, a video that is like the brief highlight, right? But this is about integrating theirs rather than doing it custom yourself. Hey, Cassidy, how you doing? Let's 
see if my bot works. Thanks yeah, for the support. Happy Pi Day. A superhero with the power of aquatic manipulation and control over water. With a simple touch, they can create, shape, and manipulate water to their will, making them a formidable force in both offense and defense. Cassidy's origin story begins with a freak accident at a marine research facility where they were exposed to an experimental serum designed to enhance human connection with water. The serum granted them their incredible powers, and they soon realized their responsibility to use their abilities for the greater good. Cassidy's costume is a sleek blue and silver silver suit, complete with a flowing cape that resembles ocean waves. They wear a mask to conceal their identity, and their symbol is a stylized wave representing their connection to the water. Cassidy's weapon of choice is a trident, which they wield with grace and precision. Yeah, so it's wired up to this thing called Vappy. Um, yeah, we just spent like three or four days making like uh, the TMIJS wiring and, you know, like the triggers for if you want to do it on a raid or bits or subs or whatever. So it's pretty fun. So yeah, it's just like a, a way of, uh, you know, making it like fun content or rewarding people for a subscription in, you know, just some way. So yeah, you can actually wire it up yourself with a totally different prompt even. Um, we just have some example prompts that I probably need to update with a few extra things we've done since then. And you can manually trigger it too. So yeah, it was a fun little thing and you're more than welcome to get it going for your stream at some point if you want. No big deal if not. As an example, that right there, I think, hold on, let me refresh. It makes especially like a bunch of sense for if someone donates bits or subscribes, because that cost me 18 cents. Right, so one penny for the speech to text, the LLM was free, the text to speech was 11 cents, Vappy takes their 5% cut, so 18 cents total, which is pretty cool. And it's not 5%, sorry, it's they're, they're just a cut of 5 cents. Looks like it's uh, 5 cents a minute. And it, we did it for less than a minute. So yeah, I don't know. Pretty reasonable uh, like return on investment if it's for something that you monetized already. But yeah! Yeah, I just started my first dev ad kit role. Cassidy, I'm not sure if you had seen the tweet or anything, but yeah. Started just this week at Get Kraken. So, I'm a bit of a fish out of water, but it should be fun. Um, Devin? I don't know, man. 13% uh, is not some wild number. <laughs> like... I don't know. I don't find it that impressive, and I'm also just not that worried about it. But yeah, real quick before we dig into OCaml, for everyone joining, we are working on a uh, static file based feature flag tool. And we can dig into what that means in a sec. Um, right now, we're doing a very brief instance of me doing, uh, like, there's a company called Highlight IO that we're tentatively planning some content, like, you know, some sponsored content and I wanna make a video that kinda of goes through what open telemetry is, why it's useful, what it would take to maybe build out your own custom op open telemetry wiring to Next.js, things like that. And I'm basically just doing an outline for what a video like that would have, or even what like a, like a meetup talk would encompass. Possibly even conference talk, so. This is my process when I have like an idea for a video or, or a, a talk. Personally, I think most of the content I wanna do on YouTube is stuff that would be great as like a meetup talk as well, right? Just slightly different content for um, like a medium, right? You're gonna use slides at a meetup, whereas instead you're gonna use like screenshots and just a little bit different delivery for a video, things like that. 
So yeah, right now this is my process. I go through and I create an outline of the things I want to talk about. And then I might even do a bit of like a run through, but I think right now all I need is the, uh, the outline. So I have a call early tomorrow morning to discuss this stuff. Yes, I am one of those people that does the homework the night before. So really, what I'm going to want to do eventually is set this up. And we might do that on Saturday or something. Because I think today and tomorrow are going to be focused on the OK. Yeah, no worries, Bob. Yeah, highlight's pretty cool. Uh, yes, Get Kraken is a U.S.-based company. They're based out of Arizona. They used to be known as Axosoft. And Axosoft was like a like a task management tool, like Jira competitor kind of thing. Then at uh, one of their like hackathon kind of things, they created Get Kraken Client, and eventually they got purchased by a private equi equity company that really wanted to focus on Get Kraken itself. So now we've got like a CLI tool. Um, they've got some really interesting like cloud features coming down the pipeline. So yeah, it's pretty cool. I got to make sure like what I can talk about and what I can't. Ooh, and hold on, my boss reached out to me. Uh, let me just respond to my boss real quick. Cool, cool, cool. So, sorry about that, everyone. Um, Oh, and I didn't realize, I thought I was like super late responding to my boss. No, he just sent it like a minute ago. <laughs> so we're good. We're good. We're good. Uh, yeah, Highlight IO is like, yeah, really like open core. Um, yeah, this would be like the first video, custom hotel integration for next. What I would want to do as a second video, and let me just do this one too. Right, video two outline, I think would be something like, um, the meat of highlights uh, next adapter, or SDK, I guess.
All right, so then this would be like the synopsis part. In this video, we uh, show, we explain Otel. Right? In this video, we explain Otel open telemetry. We dig into um, what it is and why it was created. After that, we um, show how you might uh, integrate Hotel into your next.js application might not be as simple as you think. Right, and then, yeah, so server setup, some of that stuff. I think there's going to be more that we end up adding to it, but then, um, right? Uh, what highlight brings to the table? Show side by side uh, snippets or screenshots uh, that um, showcase the amount of code needing to be. E.g., um, hundreds of lines down to, I think it's something like 50 ish. If we look at their code snippets here, let's double check it. Uh, thanks, numbers. Appreciate that. So yeah, there's... Oh, I wish they had the line numbers in here. We're going to guess at it. We're going to say... 20 or 30. The error boundary is like 4 or 5. Thrower of errors. Is that just like a really goofy name for it that they came up with? Yeah, they did. All right. Oh, thrower of errors. This is that component. It's got a use effect. Okay. Yeah, so this is just like the... the basics of like showing you an example error. Right? So that part wouldn't be part of that. Uh, and then server-side tracing would be this, which is like four or five lines. Right, with highlight config. If you wanted to do some other stuff... Right, register highlight with highlight config. This is if maybe you wanted to do it separately. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is still wiring stuff, but then inside instrumentation.ts, you need this. So that's another, like, five to ten lines. Yeah, so the next JS part. Instrumentation hook. Instrumentation.ts. Yeah, no worries, Joannis. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, sorry, uh, you know, I know it's late for you. That's my bad. Um, SSR errors getting cached, or not cached, sorry, getting caught. Oh, so yeah, app slash error dot tsx. Right, we'll do the app router specifically for brevity. 
hundreds of lines down to, and let's just say 50. Um, yeah, collector. Collector setup. So, no, not open API, duh. Open telemetry. And this is one that you can just spin up yourself. And I think you can run it not just as a library, but also as a server, right? Yeah, so where's like the running documentation? Okay. Docker pull. Telemetry gen? What is that doing? Ah, okay. So yeah, collector setup would be this. this part too. Um, standalone or as a library. Getting started there. Right, hosted collector. Um, you don't need to worry about scaling it. Um, visualizing your data. Um, Grafana. Right, could go deeper than just a quick mention depending on time. 
uh, fine-tuned um, uh, visualizations and um, Right, what's missing, and then what highlight does, right? Uh, session tracking. Anywhere you need it. Remind them of not Vercel, but serverless quirks. So yeah, I'd say this is pretty good. I'm going to save this too, because yeah, the meat of highlights next SDK, right? Deep dive. And then this would be video 1.5 outline. This one would be um, podcast style interview with Esplin, which is their like in-house uh, dev advocate or dev rel. Right, discuss hotel in general. Chat about highlight. Um, introducing ourselves, right? And these probably end up turning into sections instead. So yeah, I just want to make sure I have this ready for tomorrow, and then we're going to dig into OCaml. So yeah, chat about highlight. Um, uh, discuss um, serverless. That's all I got so far, and I think part of tomorrow might be like brainstorming on how this interview will go. So yeah, I think this is probably enough of an outline. I think a good first video, we want to make sure it's like a max of like 20 minutes. They also want to have like maybe like a, and I know the word webinar is terrible, but you know, like a demo of doing this part rather than just talking to these points. So I think that would be the trickier bit. Right, because we're gonna have to go through this process ourselves to actually understand how long it would take. Then we're gonna have to practice it so we can do it faster. And then it could even be like a, you know, like a live version of setting all this up rather than just like a talk that gives people just the info. So yeah, I don't know, I think we're good. Thank you all for bearing with me while we did that. And now, Let's shuffle that out of the way. We're going to dig into OCaml. Dylan Mulroy's favorite part. Yep, OCaml mentioned. Oh, my poor little Mac Mini is sweating.
But yeah, how's everyone doing? You enjoying your uh, your week so far? I'm enjoying my first week at uh, at Get Cracking. All right, let's close some of these tabs. All right, so yeah, VS Code OCaml plugins. Cause yeah, we're gonna be doing OCaml in VS Code. Oh, they even got some official docs too. Nice. Let's look at the official docs first. Shot yourself in the foot with schoolwork? That's a bummer. So yeah, they recommend the OCaml platform, the yes, Code extension. Perfect. I probably need to install OCaml first, too. There's a whole Ah, yeah, yeah, see, OCam. Let's just look at their official docs first. All right? But, appreciate you. Yep. Interesting that they do it that way. If I wanted to avoid brew. I really, really want to avoid brew, but it's probably the right way to keep things up to date. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good way to look at it. So yeah, first, here we go. Let me get back to, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter. I gotta fix whatever that bug is. Ooh, and you know what? We gotta close that one. And, do that. All right, so brew install OPAM. And we probably want to wait till that's done before we do the VS Code extension thing. Sorry, just responding to my boss real quick. It's important. So that was actually quick. I didn't expect uh, Brew to be that fast. All right, so now it's OPAM in it, in it. All right, and while this is going, right, does this take a bit of time? Yeah, I think it depends, two fools, right? Um, it depends on how it's, like, released. Not everything would benefit from being up on Brew, you know? I mean, it would benefit, but, like, is it is the juice worth the squeeze, I suppose, right? 
So like when we made um, uh, Git Machine, There we go, yeah, yeah, right? When we made Git Machine, which you can't see too much of, right? We used Go Releaser and Go Downloader for like all of that. So that's how we're doing our like numbered like releases up as like releases in GitHub, etc. And then it also helps us create, like Go Releaser creates like all the cross compiled binaries for all the platforms. And then that goes into your release. So it's like really nice to do and manage that way. And then Go Downloader is kind of like, it's deprecated and unmaintained, but it still works great and it generates this like, this install.sh file, which I really like. Because some things like, seriously, it's just a goofy little throwaway project. It doesn't need to be on group. Some things end up being so specific that you don't even necessarily want to publish them. Maybe you just want to have it as something that you use internally at a company but you don't want to publish that out for the greater world to use. Things like that. There is definitely value to it. Now, one good option would be wiring up your tool to check to see if it's on the latest version. That would be really useful. So that, yeah, that would be something to add where it just does like a request to GitHub, looks and sees what the latest version is, and if you're out of date, just warns you about it real quick. Bam. That's, you know, it's actually really easy to do. Ooh, okay, do we want to modify our ZishRC file? Default is no? Eh, go for it. Why wouldn't I? Oh, yeah, Nightbot's uh, followage command is broken now. That's a bummer. Uh, there's another thing we could use, actually. Hmm, I didn't know that. Yeah, I like the fact that they're giving us uh, like a really good error message with that now. That's cool. But all right, so while that's going, is it lemonade time? I think it's lemonade time. And hold up, St. Patrick's Day is on Sunday, isn't it? I might stream on Sunday on this channel, just because, right? To celebrate. We're gonna start the celebration. It's basically Friday, right? So hold on. They had a bunch of different Irish whiskeys that they don't typically have. So, I've got Green Spot, the Tear Canal, and Red Breast. I think Green Spot is the spendy one. Yeah, that one's triple distilled, whereas Tear Canal is like the cheaper one. Green Spot's good. Okay. Yeah, Costco's the best place to get uh, alcohol. Red Breast is even better. Okay. Really? All right. Good to know. We're going to start off with Tierkanel. Red Breast is your favorite whiskey? Besides Scotch, I guess. Or is it Scotch? Above Scotch? Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my favorite so far is um, Henry McKenna. That's my favorite bird. And I put that above Irish whiskey.
So yeah, I like the fancy bottle. Yep, the tear canal. I was like, hold on, what is that sound? Oh, it's the fans on my Mac Mini going crazy because this is a lot of stuff for it to compile. This poor little Mac Mini is crying. This Mac is crying. It's seen a lot of code, seen a lot of code. <laughs> All right, yeah, exactly, you know what I mean. Someone knows that song reference. It's never seen code like you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Hold on. So, yeah, we got to do the taster. Which Mac? It's a 2015 Mac Mini, which means it's Intel and slow. Right? If it were a person, it'd be in third grade right now. Another couple years, it'll be able to drive. Oh, and I, let me do the taster of this one. Almost tastes like a honey, honey aftertaste. Yeah, definitely like notes of honey. Images of a Mac Mini driving is disturbing. Yeah, I can see that. Man, here we go compiling again. Going good, chaotic, Mr. Sir. Oh, I still haven't done the hype. Anyone out here not know? Chaotic there hit his 100 stream watch streak on Monday. Yeah, legendary. Now I also stream often enough that you can hit that within a couple months, right? Within a few months, I should say. So that increases the odds of, uh, you know, that kind of situation happening. Yeah, right? Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm not sure I like it. I don't like honey, technically. It's 
just got a weird aftertaste. Yes, yeah, so this one will be uh, for guests, if I ever have guests, which I, I don't. But yeah, that one will definitely be for guests. Right? Like, if I ever buy scotch, it's really just for anyone that, like, is coming over to visit. It's not for me. <laughs> but alright, so, Opam, help. Let's look at this. Eh, you, you don't have to. You don't have to like everything. That's okay. Alright, so we've got Opam installed. Looks pretty good. No, 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 and I'm not saying bad. I'm just saying like, yeah, I expect guests might actually like honey. So then it's for them. It's not like I'm gonna be a jerk and be like, oh yeah, they get the junk. No, it's just, it's not for me. That's all. Yeah, maybe a little more like uh, lemonade mix in it. But okay, so, here's one thing we want to do. Get checkout main, get full origin main. We're also going to merge DM Mulroy's branch. I'm okay with it. It's more like work in progress-y than we typically merge in, but it's a perfect time for it. And hold on, let's look at Joannis's real quick. Assert greater than? Okay, sure. I left that in from a copy-paste. That was a mistake. Yep. Good catch. That is better. Yeah, he didn't like the error. The way we were doing it. I get that. preferred a bunch of this stuff to be done in separate files. Oh, right. He's removing our extensions. That part's probably fine. Let me look at utils. So what's wrong with safe get? And I guess we need to look at the client to see how he's doing some of those looks.
That was a good rename. So what about here in this, sh this other stuff? Let me go look at how he's doing the graduate. Okay, that part's fine. So then let's look at the get feature function real quick. Okay, so I see what they're doing. I think that makes sense. There's the hasher, that one's fine. He extracted this bit out, sure. Yeah, I like that, that's clean. Yeah, we were doing a bunch of repetition. Okay. So yeah, none of the assertions changed. Okay, cool. Let's just uh, make sure everything passes still. Yeah, Swift Pro went in and helped out quite a bit. However, it doesn't run the tests. Can I add a run? All right, let me double check one thing in my test.yaml. I think there's something wrong with my trigger. No, we see branches. But it's a pull request. Yes, we're missing a trigger. Hmm, okay. So I'm gonna have to add that, yeah. Um, GitHub actions. Uh, runs on. No, it's not runs on. That's not what I want. I want on. Events that trigger workflows. We probably do want just the pull request event. Yeah, okay. I think we just want types star?
Yeah, I think we just do that. So. We actually have to pick. So opened, edited, reopened. Are there any others that we think would be worthwhile? This one just runs our testing, not our deployment. So I think we're good. Fix, add, pull, request, trigger, to test. All right, and then now. Let's go look at DM Mulroy's pull request here. I'm gonna squash and merge. Um, let's say feet. Uh, bring in recent O camel SDK changes. All right, so we got that merged in. But yeah, how's it going, Eskimenia? So all that should be fine. All right, so back to the main process. We got our Git stuff done, but we need to add the OCaml platform. So, OCaml bytecode compiler, OCaml C, was not found in the current sandbox. The LSP is not found either. Um, I did in my terminal, right? Wherever that was. Oh, I think we closed it. But we added it to our Zish. 
right? Alright, let's do it this way. Nano. Get all the way to the bottom. Hopefully they're not revealing anything. Cool, there we go. So, OPAM configuration, right? It runs that. Is there any harm in adding the eval part? I did it directly after the install for sure. Uh, there was a mention that it's something you have to do at like the start of your shell session, right? So if I throw it into my zishrc file, then I think we're good. Right? Is there any harm in adding that to my zishrc? Let's make sure we're in a new tab. So you're saying I probably shouldn't need this. So let's not save the buffer. All right, OCaml C is there. All right, so this has it. But the main reason this has it is because this session works. VS Code may not see it. Okay, so that session had it too. Let me just double check. Uh, let's kill that one, create a new one. All right, so that actually seems fine then. That's probably the thing we need to do, right? Because the VS Code session is older than when we ran that eval. With shell hooks. Well, let's try and restart VS Code real quick just to see. We have an update anyway. Let me double check, make sure there's no like email I'm missing at work. Yeah, I think we're good. Oh, that's the highlight.io stuff. We'll just pop that to the end over there. And what's up, not homework? And yeah, cool, okay. Uh... Oh, oh, switches. So like basically I would have a file. Hold on, here we go. Oh, never mind. Hold on. Yeah, for some reason I was thinking it was gonna be like, um, like an NVM RC file, where if you have it in your local, um, like in a, in a folder, as you CD into that folder, it'll switch your node version for you. Is that a thing that OPAM does as well? Like via switches? 
I know, I know. I, I'm just saying that's what would do it. Okay. Cool. That's fine, not homework. I don't care. The only people that care are you guys that comment on it all the time. I don't understand why. Like, why does someone else's workflow bother you that much? Why are you so concerned with how I choose to work? really question why. Look at this. Within 547 people being recorded as mentioning tabs, do you think tab grouping came up in that time? Looks like we are done. The .NET stuff did its thing. Let's double check the OCaml platform extension. Command not found, OCaml LSP. And that's where I need the shell hooks thing again, right? Okay. I'm just double checking, just looking at it, trying to verify the flow here. Um, that might be a thing that needs to be called out in the VS Code specific tooling docs. That's fine. Hold on, yeah, yeah, yeah. So OCaml LSP server in OCaml format in our switch. There it is, ah, yeah, yeah. So you actually still have to install that. I didn't realize it was a separate install. Oh no, I won't be able to use Mercurial? Woe is me. Yeah, we looked at it briefly. Yeah, platform tools, I probably need to install. Plenty of providers that give the idea of like merge queues and stuff, but with Mercurial, they're actually like um, it's part of the the VCS instead. That makes sense. But yeah, GitHub has merge queues or merge trains. GitLab has their version of it. Um, Git Kraken has I well not necessarily something that specific, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Woe is me.
But no, instead it's just saying like, hey, you don't have HG yet. Hey, you don't have darts yet. And there may be some OCaml libraries that are using those VCS systems, which makes sense. Yeah, that's something that we kind of want to do as as a company at Get Kraken, where there may be companies switching to Git from some other VCS. And yeah, I really think some like focused content around the differences in the migration pattern would be useful. So yeah, like I got to really brainstorm content. Uh, what's up with Dune? Oh, gotcha. Oh, that was for Priv. Got it, got it. Yeah, I missed that. The Jira integration. Nice! Hell yeah! Um, how should I pronounce your name? <clears throat> Sorry. How should I pronounce your name? Um, get some or Yule? I'm gonna guess like Yule. Like, is that your name or is it? I don't know. Get some. Okay. Or should I say the whole thing? Get some Yule. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, but I'm guessing. But you use it at work. Um, man, I'd be really curious. Um, have you chatted with anyone at Get Kraken about that stuff yet? Because if not, I mean, that's kind of my job now. Get some wool. If you can give me, like, the exact reference, that'd be fine. Or the exact pronunciation. Okay, you've been using it for, like, three or four years? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to, to understand more about it if you can chat. Uh, feel free to DM me in Discord or uh, Twitter, whichever you prefer. I'd love to chat more about it and understand your use case. That's my job now. It's my first job as, or my first time being a developer advocate as my job. So I'm kind of like figuring out how it all works anyway. So yeah, yeah, I'd be stoked. Yeah, just send me a message. Discord or Twitter, either one. Yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, like uh, Joannis was in here earlier. They were mentioning that some of the things we were showing might actually be really useful for them. I need to check to see if it's actually possible. How many SDKs? Ooh, hold on. Let me do the math. JavaScript, Python, PHP, Go, Rust, Elixir, C Sharp. Kotlin, Swift. And we're working on OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man, focus view is, like, something we're really focusing on. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, uh... If you've got really good feedback about any of, like, our newer features, I would love to hear about it. That'd be cool. How many are left after OCaml? Um, I want to do a Lua SDK. I want to do a Ruby SDK. And... To learn Zig, I might as well do a Zig SDK. Beyond that, maybe a uh, bad cop comes on and we make a, a bash SDK. Not even sure what that would look like. But why not?
Um, I think if we end up doing a Zig one, it ends up being fully compatible with C++. But maybe not, and maybe like that's where Bash, or sorry, not Bash, Bad Cop would actually help us out a lot. Bash Cop <laughs> would actually be able to help us do the C++ SDK too. So it's kind of one of those like tomato, tomato, depends on what's more valuable, I guess. Um, I mean, the the big ones, I wouldn't say they've been requested, but there's enough like market share to justify it, right? For Lua, I'd want to do it for, you know, NeoVim extensions. Why not, right? You could do runtime feature flagging of a NeoVim extension. That's awesome. There's also a whole bunch of stuff out in the world that is written in Lua, right? If you want to do Open Resty, which is a web framework, that's a Lua framework because it's Nginx modules and stuff, right? So for the most part, I'm just doing them based upon what I see as like used and relevant still. So am I gonna do one for Pascal? Probably not. Am I gonna do one for Perl? <sighs> I'd have to see some major like metrics of that being useful. But then for the Zig one, I think Zig just has enough like of a zeitgeist that it's worth it. Maybe doing one for Gleam would make sense if there's enough people using it. Uh, actually, a COBOL SDK might totally be it. Yeah, COBOL is used far more than Pascal, right? My must-haves, we're basically at the must-haves. I'd say Ruby is probably part of the must-haves still. The Lua, maybe less so, but still useful. Okay, um, is that a thing that we have like an issue or a discussion tracking it? Do you know if you've looked into it? Oh, COBOL is huge. Every phone number dialed in the US goes through a COBOL mainframe. They are not going to refactor that to Elixir or to Erlang. Erlang is the European telephony systems thing. Telephony here in the US is still COBOL. Know how I know? Those were the number one companies that would hire my parents as contractors. My parents were basically telephony contractors. My mom helped write number portability for the 1-800 system. So when you dial 1-800 and it routes to some landline or some like other addressable like phone number, that software my mom helped write. I'm not gonna say she's the only one on that team or any of that BS, but yeah, she was a contractor that helped write that. My, when you dial a 1-800 number, at least as far as I remember, or, or as far as I know, because I haven't kept up to date on if they changed out the hardware system, I don't really see them doing that. My dad, at least for all of the 90s, when you dialed 1-800, it went through the hardware system that he designed. Right? Like three giant mainframes separated by 300 miles each for redundancy and, you know, uh, catastrophe protection. Yeah, he designed that entire, like, architecture, right? What hardware you needed to buy, how to put it together, what specs you needed to meet with it, the constraints of it. He was dealing with Samsung solid state memory back in, like, 1989. Right, because hard disk is slow. RAM is volatile. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, pretty crazy stuff. My parents are legit. Now here's the thing though. My dad is not much of a coder and definitely not anymore. But even then, he, he wasn't a coder for the majority of my life. He, he became like a hardware person for the most part. He's one of those people that says C is too high level. Why not just write it in assembly? Yeah, Dad, that's how I know you don't write software. <laughs> like, come on.
Mm, no, nah, my parents never did Fortran. My mom's old enough to have done punch cards, though. Pretty sure, like, uh, like when I was born, even, I think they were still in punch cards at, like, a courthouse or some stuff. Like, I'm not positive. I'd have to double check. Yeah. A good learning exercise? Yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah, seems cool. Uh, but okay. Do I want to continue? Yeah. Probably could have done like a dash dash Y to make it auto do it. Whoops. Oh, whoops. Um, here's the question though. So I just ran this command. OCaml LSP server, ODOC, OCaml format, and UTOP. Do I need to get Dune separately? I think I do, right? Oh, it's weird that it wasn't part of its original... Like, why wasn't it in that command? That's weird. There's a way around it? Oh, did you find it? Nice. So it throws a warning saying, uh, help center for the win? Ooh, that's huge too. Hold up. I am going to screenshot that. Hold on. I hope you're okay with me uh, screenshotting this and sharing it with, uh, with my workplace. I could make it bigger. Oh, I know how I can do this. One second. Because, yeah, this is important. This is part of my job. Um, and you don't have to share here if you don't want, but I'd love to know what company it is. Uh, no need to dox yourself at all, though. So if you're willing to let me know over in like a, a PM or something, that'd be really cool. And if not, that's totally fine too. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, appreciate you. Uh, am I going to be on for a bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll be on for another at least two hours, probably three, maybe even four. I do want to play some games a bit later, but yeah, it's not a rush. Ah, uh, so I might not need Dune, but it would be useful. Okay, I'm gonna install it anyway, why not? This thing's taking its sweet time. Yeah, no worries, for sure. See you in a bit. While this is going though, I'm gonna use the restroom. It's a BRB.
And yeah, how's everyone doing? What y'all up to? Oh, my poor little Mac Mini is sweating. Uh, Elder Scrolls Online. Is it good? When it first came out, it was alright. Here we go compiling again. 1,400 hours since November uh, 2019. Cool. So, like, good story? Or is it more about just, like, the social aspect of the game? Because that's something I really liked about um, Star Wars The Old Republic. The single, like, the, the story and the campaign is actually, like, really good. Like, it's almost as good as just, like, a single-player campaign. Like in a just a standard game that you didn't pay for. Or that you did pay for, right? So yeah, pretty cool. Let me pop out the YouTube chat, make sure I'm not neglecting anybody. How y'all doing over on uh, YouTube? Custom stream parrot emote. Which one's that going to be there, X Factor? So you've been playing Elder Scrolls since Morrowind. Same. 3,000 hours of Skyrim over 10 years. I bet you got a, a pretty good selection of uh, mods. That's actually what all 3,000 hours were just trying different mods. Right? Yeah, not sure how I missed that thread. That's, that's my bad. That's a bummer. But yeah. Never played the main quest and never used mods? Didn't even know about mods until a few years ago. Interesting. Yeah, I'm one of those people that will definitely do like all the side missions before I advance any of the story. And then if I do some story and it opens up more side missions, so be it. That's how I did it with, um, with Witcher 3 when I first played it. Problem is, with Witcher 3, I did every side mission before expansions. Uh, and then got to the end and they were like, oh, and make sure that you do whatever because this is the final thing. And it's like, you know, if you tell me it's the final mission, I'm just not going to do it. It's, right? Like, yeah. So I'm basically done already. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. So I really l don't want a game to tell me that the final mission is coming. Just do an autosave. And when you finish, allow the person to go back to the autosave. Right? Don't dispel the magic. Never tell a girlfriend that it's temporary. It becomes way more temporary in that in that case. Don't ask me how I know. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is over 10 years ago. Who cares? Yeah, perfect time. Install package user setup? I don't think I need that, right? No, it's not even that, that much of a story. The story's over. That's it. Right? If it's a summer fling, don't tell them it's a summer flame. Technically, this was a winter flame, but you know. It rapidly moves up the expiration date. So, what is the user setup package? Let's go look at it, right? Because it should be over here on OCaml's packages repository, right? Yeah, let's check it out. I think this is really only relevant if we're using Emacs or Vim, right? I don't think this is a VS Code thing. Alright, so, next up, we see the OCaml extension. I probably just want to do a restart extension host. Hold up. Here's a really good question. And DM Mulroy, if you're out there, or Prevan, or anyone who does OCaml, is there a good place to find usage metrics based upon version of OCaml? Every single language out there in the world needs telemetry to understand that. If they don't have it yet, that would be a major thing that they should probably get going. You know, let people opt out of the telemetry, sure. It's fine. You said you could help. I'm kidding. It's fine, man. No worries. Alright, so let me look this up. OCaml version usage statistics. As far as telemetry goes? Yeah, I mean, whether it becomes opt-in or opt-out, I guess, right? That's the important part. But it would be so useful just for like the ecosystem in general. At some point, if you want your tooling to be good, you gotta take off the tinfoil hat. Ooh, let me kick this off real quick. I think I can edit.
Um, so I think you're still missing it, right? Backwards compatibility doesn't guarantee forwards compatibility. That's the important part. So, in a similar way, there are certain things in the Go ecosystem that you could use that would make it not work in Go 1.4, right? Because it was introduced in 1.9 and there's no like backporting that feature, right? 1.4 code will always be backwards compatible into 1.9, but it can't go backwards. So at that point, you need to pick a base minimum version of what your users are using. Which is why we target PHP 7.4. Which is why we target Python 3.6. That's where the users are still. Does it mean that our code is uglier because of it? Yeah, and that's, that's the name of the game. By caring about that, we make a better SDK. <laughs> Users should just upgrade. Tell me you've never released tooling without telling me you've never released tooling. Tell me you've never released a, a library without telling me you've never released a library. That is an incredibly unrealistic demand. For numerous reasons. And no offense, I'm just, I know I might seem like a jerk right now. I'm just, I'm trying to be a little fun with it. But yeah, like seriously, you can't do that. That's not a thing. Right? My Chrome could tell this story for years. My Chrome is very upset that I haven't updated it. No, so hold on, Insanities. I think you're missing it. There's a big difference between backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility. Golang is 100% backwards compatible. 100%. In Go 1.9, you will always be able to use any other code that was written for go one dot whatever as long as it's an earlier version but it's impossible to make that go forwards you're not going to be able to make go 1.9 work inside of go 1.4 it's just not going to work for various very obvious reasons at this point backwards compatibility is important forwards compatibility is hard bordering on impossible Do they? Oh, there are definitely things that won't work. I'd be really curious about trying to use a memory arena in Go 1.4 code. I don't expect that would ever work. Right? As they add features to the language, those features need to be backported. And why would you want to do backporting to go 1.1? You know? Like, I don't know. I find that hard to believe, too. Are memory arenas getting removed? So that already breaks the forward compatibility thing. <laughs> okay, 1.18 is when they're going to do it. Which means they're basically just planning Go 2.0. If they're saying Go 1.x will be fully forward compatible, yeah, they're planning Go 2.0 at this point. Oh, it was an experiment. 
Got it, got it. For some reason, I thought it was officially released. I didn't realize it was still an experiment. Yeah, I just, I don't think that's possible. I think it's a lofty goal, but I, I don't know. Time will tell. Yeah, so that's not gonna work. All right, so we've got a flaw in how PRs need to be tested. Hold on, let me do this real quick. Interesting tuples. I did not know that. Oh, and then, yeah, we got to do that. All right, so that's the PR. This is the test. Maybe this one we just do closed. And then we should be good. All right, so let me get that pushed up real quick. So we'll see if that works. Uh, if you do exclamation point song, you'll get the current one. Oh, never mind, my bots crashed. <sighs> I lied. What a dirty liar. All right, try it one more time. Okay, so we got that. 
Um, it looks to me like our OCaml extension is good. Let's go look at some OCaml code and see if uh, see if it does what we want. Okay, and then this is because I haven't done an install yet, right? It, and it would just be something like opam install. Nope. Uh, yeah, let me look it up. Oh, Dune would probably be the thing that does it, right? Oh, a build does the fetching too, kind of like a cargo build? Okay. Yeah, so none of that's found. Oh, it doesn't? Dune install? So it would be open. I would want depths only. So if I don't do depths only, what happens? Does it end up installing my my OCaml like library into my bin or something? Ah, okay. Oh, but I need the dot. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I get it. I get it. Oh, and the dash dash yes would have skipped the confirmation. Got it. But yeah, basically looking at this file, we can see that with those things missing, that means that our language server is actually working. So we're good there.
Wait, what do you mean, MD Fury? Like, do you actually mean you came from the YouTube channel? Because you're chatting on Twitch right now. One of the Get Kraken co-founders is a Melange core developer at Arefs. What is Arefs? Oh, it's an SEO tool. Oh. John Haley. I don't think I knew that. What feature are you talking about, MD Fury? He's a cool dude. Nice. He's still down in the Phoenix area, too. Cool. He's a maintainer of NodeGit. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's a video I want to talk about. <laughs> NSFW is a totally different thing. <laughs> it's not what I was expecting. I saw that on a co-worker's uh, thing when they were, like, I saw a folder labeled not safe for work when they were showing their finder. It was probably this, <laughs> which is totally different. <laughs> I, I was like... <laughs> yeah, just had that, like, you know, did the side eye. <laughs> like, uh, wonder if he knows he showed that, but it's probably just this. So that's even funny. That makes so much more sense now. That makes so much more sense now. But yeah, super cool. Wait, did he create this too? Wow, he's prolific. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's a fork. It's probably just a fork. Come on, how's our install done? Oh, it's done. All right, cool. Look at this uh, source. He makes a lot of stuff. Yeah, interesting.
All right, so hold up. Unbound module URI.T. Maybe I need to restart the extension? Or do I need to build? and restart the extension host. So wait, yeah, MD Fury, like, what are you talking about? And X Factor. Yeah, you never really told me uh, what emote you want to do. Did you? Oh, you DM'd me the link here on Twitch. I never see Twitch uh, DMs. One sec. Okay, yeah, I see it. Alright, so it looks like the VS Code extension needed to reboot. Is that something you run into with NeoVim as well, like having to restart the LSP? So OCaml 4.14, you have to restart every now and again. 5.1 has been really solid. Got it. All right, so yeah, the nailed it should be good. Give it maybe 30 seconds. Um, and yeah, so the version Boom, that's that right there. Okay. So that's a problem. I compiled for the wrong version here, and that's where an OPAM switch would be important, right? using the terminal. Oh, and I can just, oh, I can just point it to that. 
gonna take a while again. Yeah, it is what it is. Bummer. Now I guess I just have time to pour another beverage. Woe is me. Whatever shall I do? Ooh, um, Dylan. I mean beverage. So Dylan, if you haven't tried it yet, you might enjoy Westland. It's pretty solid. It's very uh, scotchy, like in some of its flavoring. Like not peaty, but it reminds me of a scotch. So it's an American single malt. Non-chill filtered, no coloring added. Yeah, it's worth checking out. No rush. This one I'm not a fan of, right? The tear canal. It's got like a, a real like honey like aftertaste. If you like honey, you'll probably like it. Okay, so let's pour this water here. Hold on, let's do like the raw taster. Like we're getting follow botted. Well, it's actually a small chunk. But yeah. All ending with four numbers. All very uh random generation style. Aha, so I'd have to do like 4.14. Dot dot three? I, I think I want 4.14.2. Hold on, what one do we have in the open? 4.14.1. Ah, oh. but looks like dot two would be okay because uh, this is just the minimum. Sure. could it be? Those were also good famous last words. What are you gonna do? Stab me? Said guy that was stabbed.
I think we're fine. Um, and yeah, how many people we got out there that actually use Get Kraken at work? I got some actual questions for you. Like, get some if you're back. I got a question for you. I need to cut my hair. Might do that this weekend. It's getting so long, it's getting caught in my, like, my collar. I hate it. But yeah, while we're waiting for this to compile, while my Mac Mini is sweating, what's everyone up to? Anything fun? about YouTube? What's everyone up to over on the YouTube? that is going. Let's go look at our GitHub Vexilla stuff. Time for bed? 1 a.m. in Sweden? Yeah, sounds about right. We had Joannis in here earlier. He's also from Sweden. Yeah, thanks for Ben.
Yeah, 515, we may run into the PHP bug. But the other should work. Ooh, this one. OCaml base compiler takes a while to get compiled. That's meta. Yeah, there's the PHP failure. I was kind of expecting that one. The Swift failing is interesting. Test should have been skipped. Um, the PR test uh, test Swift job seems to be failing. Not what I wanted. H, that's fine. Is that a regression? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know what the issue for it is. But yeah, my code compiled. So you don't gotta be a pro. Um, do exclamation point song if you want the current command or the current song playing.
There you go. Yeah, now you got it. All right, we're still compiling here. Was that me the other night? Was that like right after the Swift code compiled? Pretty sure it was, huh? That was right after the long Swift battle and many lemonades. It doesn't look like I had that many lemonades. A long, swift battle. That is a good oxymoron. Yeah, yeah. Good wordplay. Yeah, for anyone that hasn't heard me say this yet, um, the new machine that I got for Get Crack and Work is a Mac Mini. No, no, sorry, not a Mac Mini, brain fart. It's a MacBook Air, like a, a mini guy, like a 14-incher, I think. I was skeptical of its ability to edit video. So, luckily, Blackmagic, the people that make uh, DaVinci at this point, like DaVinci Resolve, they have a Blackmagic RAW, like, tester to actually measure performance of working with with certain videos, especially the Blackmagic RAW uh, encoding. I have a MacBook Pro. It's a 2015, but it has a GPU in it and everything, right? It has like a... like a 960. So pretty old. But the MacBook Air massively outperforms my MacBook Pro. And that's really, like, the power of 10 years of, like, better processors. And, you know, Apple Silicon being that much faster and all that. Yeah, the M chips are incredible. It's kind of crazy. Kind of crazy. Um, let me look. It's brand new, so... Right, like, they bought it from the Apple Store. Recently. So it's an M3. So that's probably a big part of it. So yeah, just massively faster. 24 gigs of RAM. Like, yeah, this thing's killing it. Like, yeah. I was a little worried when I noticed it was uh, an Air. And, pff, yeah, dude. I shouldn't have worried. So if we were to ask a question such as, who let the dogs out? It would be very obvious that Dylan let the dogs out. Uh, what are you eating? What do you got for food? This is a foodie stream in disguise. Grilled chicken and veggies. Nice. I mean, that's still pretty cool.
Ooh, I got a question. Dia Mulroy, um, for your work, without digging into anything proprietary or, like, you know, that would dox anything, do you work with, like, more than one repo? Or is everything, like, mono-repoed for, like, the team that you're on? Multiple mono repos. Oh, so it gets even crazier than that. Okay. Interesting. So, technically, right? I wouldn't expect you to opt for the Git Kraken client unless you needed to really dig into something like crazy hard merge conflict wise or something, right? But even then, you're probably more comfortable in the CLI. Technically, they have a CLI tool now, too. Oh, that's an Omizish issue. So, yeah, like, you know, um, GKPR list. Boom, we can see that the Swift one is John. It's not something we're gonna discuss. I assume you're trolling there, Small. Big fan? Cool. Well, yeah, technically, the reason I asked about the, the NeoVim extension thing is I'd love to wrap some of the output for this thing into NeoVim in some way, especially something like that. But focus view might be a little trickier. And I'm not sure it'll be something at all that they care about, but I'm, you know, I'm just brainstorming. So, uh, yeah, GK focus, I think. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, get out of here, troll. Right, so focus view is a place to like, you know, you can look at your PRs, your issues, all in your terminal, without having to like jump over to GitHub, or wherever. It's kinda cool. This is the CLI, yeah. Um, I really wanna maybe try and do like a podcast style like interview thing with um, with Bash Bunny because this is Charm Bracelet, uh, like UI stuff. Does it have a good Git log graph view? No, so that's the one thing where I actually kind of like pointed out like Git LG, you know, like pretty good. This doesn't exist anywhere. Instead, they just funnel you towards um, they funnel you towards uh, just this, the, the GUI. So if I were to do git graph, help maybe? Oh, not git, sorry, gk graph. Right, there's basically just like four things where it's like, where do you want to open either git kraken, git lens, git lens codium, or git lens insiders? Yeah, I think that would be the hard part. Like, at the bare minimum, if we just established this alias for you, but like, you know, without changing your global config, just doing it within our output, would that work? It's better than nothing? Because it still gives you like the, the branching flow and all that. Maybe some way of then interacting with each one of these, like, you know, to parse the output and make it interactive to where you could like dig into and inspect the commits. I don't know. I, I like. I'm really looking for some feedback in that regard, just to understand it more. 
Because that was something I noticed earlier today too. Like the the graph is not native to the CLI, and it's probably really complicated to do. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the same thing, though. I'm almost positive that's the same thing. So yeah, like, are you using LG1 or LG2, I guess? I'm not sure what the actual differences are. Just the way that, like, the dates and stuff are reported? Okay. You've customized it a bit from there. Okay. Yeah, get log with some customized filters and options. Yeah, the one I always do is like, uh, it's like better commit log, and it's, uh, I forget where it's from. Uh, commit log. Better get log. That's it. So yeah, this is the article from just ages ago. Oh wait, that's not the one. Damn it. A better get log coder wall. This is the one. Right? This is like the super ancient one. This thing's been around for 10 years or something like that, right? But yeah, I remember this article from a long time ago. So yeah, would you say that would still be valuable, just aliasing this so that people don't even like need to change their git config? And then possibly making it like interactive by being able to click into into specific commits to see what they do? That would be cool. Okay. So similar to saplings thing. Where have you used Sapling? I'm curious about that. Is that something you use locally at all? Personally for a while? Okay, cool. Ooh, this one's pretty as well. Less like color coding, but still pretty cool. That one's pretty as well. I like that. Aha, and this gets you over to like a web interface that's like more interactive. Maybe. It's open source. Probably uh, permissively licensed, I would hope. Oh, it's the Facebook thing. That's right, that's right. Okay. Yeah, why Facebook doesn't use Git or whatever. I've seen those articles. So GPL 2.0 is probably a non-starter. Basically just open source Mercurial. Yeah, so we couldn't touch their source code whatsoever. Um, I don't think they could copyright or patent the layout of this. That would be like a design patent rather than something copyrightable. But we could at least just do the get LG alias, right? Still better than forcing you into the, the GUI. And then after you run the GUI or even like while the git log is showing, just a quick thing like, hey, if you want this to be more interactive, a more full-featured version is in the GUI or the web, right? Something like that. Okay, cool. I really think that would actually be not, not too hard to do either. And it's just, it's nicer than forcing people to the client. Yeah, all right. Note to self. That was a note that I took earlier too. I'm just more like validating it with potential users. And I know that you're like very like command line focused. So 
yeah, your feedback is really important. All right, so how's our install going? Oh, we're done. Yeah, yeah, we're totally done. Duh. All right, so now we can actually maybe get to some coding. Do I need to do OPIM, uh, like the, the ENV thing again? When changing like versions via switch? Probably not, right? Just making sure I don't run into some crazy bugs. Oh, probably. Oh. All right. If I do the, the ENV here, does it default to looking for the .opam file? Yeah, yeah, I don't think I need the switch part, and technically my default would be 5.1, right? So that would actually be the wrong version. So yeah, we're currently on 4.14, perfect. That's right, we gotta do a rebuild. And I should probably kick it to dune build dash W, right? Just to, like keep it going. Now this alco test thing, there's like another command I'd have to run to install alco test that's not depths only, it's like dev depths only or something like that. With test? Oh. Interesting. Oh, wait, 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 I get it. Hold on. So basically what you're saying is we don't have those in here because only runtime dependencies or like production dependencies make it there. Test dependencies don't have any way of being documented. Well, no, there it is. Yeah, with test. Ah, hold up. That's why the with test thing works because it's annotated by this like tag, right? So technically if you wanted to do like with testing, then we'd change that. OPAM calls them filters. So you, we could do like custom filters then, right? Oh, no custom filters? Really? Oh, that's annoying. There's just with test and with doc? I say that's uh, I think that's a miss. Why be so dogmatic about it? And why not just let people create their own filters and then you're done? I could see why like those might be protected filters at least. Like you can't make your own custom one for with test, with docking, with development. But I really, really think custom filters would be a great idea. Anyone here know the name John O. Bacon?
I've never seen the name, but our C CEO really knows him. Sounds like a character from a sea shanty song. Touche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a man, he's John O'Bacon. Da 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 da. <laughs> or something, right? Like, yeah. I can see that. I get it. Works for me. That makes sense. Cool. All right, so. I know we could just dis install the packages directly. I want to look up the syntax for the filters, though. Interesting. Good documentation. I like that. All right. Um. Nope, that ain't it. Oh, but I'd have to do the dot. Yeah. All right, so that isn't it. Oh, and yeah, I installed mine. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, let me look this up. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Oh, depths only and then with test? Yeah, hold on. Let me double check. Um, install with... with tests. Oh, now it's probably a mistake. Nope. Oh, so it is with tests. Hold on, after an install like this, do I then need to go and do the, the ENB thing again?
Hmm. All right. Well, whatever. Gotcha. It happens. Could be worse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that is super weird to me. Eh, something they'll need to fix at some point, but not the end of the world. So now if we do a build Cool. Now does this run our tests too? Or is there another command to have tests run? Looks like there's another command to have our test. Okay, cool. Um, okay, these are the names of the tests. Client here is the failure. These are the assertions that worked, right? I'd almost like to see that in green for some reason, but okay. And the one that failed is during global start end. All right. Um, let's see. So, OCaml print line. How do we do that? So print char, print string, print int, print float, print end line, which is like print string, but outputs a whole new line. All right. So I probably want print end line. Oh, so I should be using format, which means I got to bring in format as like an import.
Oh, you're right, because we're on the wrong versions. Yes, that's a good call. Ah, right, right, right. Yep. Great point. Yep. Very good point. Yeah. All right. Yep. So here we go, compiling again. Here we go, killing the Mac Mini again. Double check and work. Cool, cool. Yep, good to go. It's late enough in the day, I don't think anyone's going to be reaching out for anything. It's a MacBook Air, and it's with an M3, not an M1. Now, are you saying what I'm compiling with right here? No, I'm compiling with the 2015 Mac Mini. It's Intel and really slow. Does have 16 gigs of RAM? Oh, I mean, dude. This Mac Mini is almost a member of the family at this point. It has earned its key. I've known this Mac Mini more than I've known most of y'all. Yeah, all the CPU cycles. This Mac Mini is my oldest friend at this point. <laughs> it is, it really is, yeah. I will most likely upgrade at some point, but this Mac Mini will live on in perpetuity, I might turn it into like a, a media center machine or something. All right, hook it up to a TV, get Hulu and some other stuff on it. Not like get Hulu, but like it's it would basically just be like a like a media center machine. I do plan on upgrading soon. Exactly. It deserves it. Yeah, for sure. It has been steadily contributing to its 401k. We should let it enjoy its 401k at some point. Yeah, so Vexilla, oh man. Anyone here from the raid earlier? I know I said I would say what Vexilla is. Now's the perfect time to do it. I can explain it. So, first and foremost, feature flagging is incredibly important because you can only release as fast as the slowest version of your build or your deploy, right? So if you wanna change something, you are beholden to the time that it takes for a deployment, right? So let's just say you wanna change the title on your web app. If your web app compiles within three to four minutes, then who cares? And, and you're a solo dev and there's no code review process or rigmarole for it, yeah, go for it. It's not a problem. However, I've worked at plenty of places where there's a dev environment, a staging environment, and a, a prod environment. And they're all branches from your code base. Those 
need to be individually reviewed and QA'd. And that process can easily take 20 minutes. There's the CICD process for all of it to make sure you still compile with the ENV bars that you need. And if, if you're doing a significantly large enough application, yeah, that's probably 20 minutes. So you're looking at like a half hour per environment, pretty much bare minimum. If you have three environments, that means you're not getting a feature up to production for an hour and a half. And that assumes that you have all of the communication streamlined enough and everyone's at their PC ready to do their code review for you the moment you try and push it. Most people I know don't do code review all day long because that would be gnarly. They have like a block that they do it, and if it's not during your block, you reach out to them for a review, or they do it the next day. So yeah, bare minimum hour and a half. You know what the worst case scenario is? Mobile apps. It can easily take a week for a mobile app to get released, because you have to go through the review process of the app store, and all that stuff. I've worked at companies that did uh, semi-weekly releases. It was a web app, you could have released it quicker, but it's one of those things where they go through, they do the QA, and they do a release on a Tuesday and a Thursday kind of thing, right? If you need to ship something as a fix outside of that, you are introducing all sorts of chances for errors and bugs to crop up because anything that is out of the normal, like, routine ends up becoming bugged. So the whole reason to really make this point about deployment is because runtime feature flags save us from being dependent on our deploy process. You do need to write the flags, ship them up, but if you want to turn something on for 10% of your users, and then, hey, it's working for them, roll it out to 20% of your users. Hey, it's working for them, you can do that gradual rollout, but then if something breaks, you can just turn it off. And all of this is only beholden to how often you're fetching your flags. It needs to be 100% decoupled from your deploy process. So runtime flag evaluation is the only thing that actually matters for this stuff. So that's feature flagging in general. Once you've understood that feature flagging is a necessity and it's part of the 12-factor app, which was put out by Heroku that really did promote like Heroku services and all that BS, right? There's a reason they made that article, marketing. But the 12-factor app is still hugely useful today, right? Hitting every single step of a 12-factor app is less important, but a bunch of the steps in that 12-factor app process are important. So, Vexilla is the feature flag idea, but it does it with static files. So, your JSON payload, sits wherever you want to put it and then the logic of the flag being turned on or off is evaluated by the SDKs at runtime. So all logic sits within the SDKs. There's no server besides the file server that's serving that JSON and I think we all know that file servers are one of the most easily scalable solutions ever to deploy. So you most likely already have a file server serving up your front-end assets anyway. Maybe it's CloudFront, you know, on some CDN, whatever. You have a way of distributing massively scalable front-end assets or just static assets. That is one of the easiest things to scale at this point. So you get full scalability from this static file. You don't have to maintain a server to self-host it, right? I don't even have a service for you to sign up for yet. So it's all self-hosted but it's just a JSON file. And then your SDKs evaluate that and get it into your applications. Front end, back end, whatever. One of the interesting things that I think might get overlooked with the static file approach is that as long as it's a JSON file you can fetch from anywhere, right? As long as the place you're trying to consume it can access the place where the JSON file is, you're good to go, which means that you can do it within internal networks that aren't allowed to have external internet access. So you could actually do internal rollouts for a, like an enterprise accounting app that makes your accountant's jobs easier, but you're not releasing that out to the, the broader internet. No way in hell. So you're probably behind some VPC, right? Virtual private cloud in AWS, and that stuff never touches the public internet. 
bam, totally supported by just being a JSON. How'd I do? Did I, uh, did I fill in enough blanks right there about why Vexilla, why feature flagging? While we're still waiting for this, I can yet add like one extra bit. The magic of Vexilla, because it's just a JSON file sitting somewhere, it means I have zero overhead of operating a server for that stuff. I have no service or expense for that, which means it frees me up to focus on broad language compatibility. So right now we have eight or nine SDKs for various languages, front end, back end, etc. And yeah, we can actually support more SDKs than any other provider because number one, I'm able to do that as a solo dev. Not many organizations have that power. And my bandwidth is freed up because I'm only doing the client logic. I'm not having to worry about server. That was helpful, awesome. I need to work on explaining these kind of things to people because eventually maybe there will be a Vexilla cloud. Right? Doing a, a static file host and setting up the CDN and S3 might be something you just don't want to do and you could pay me to do it. Bam, no problem. What's up, Daruti? How you doing? Yeah, welcome from Spain. I think I have, uh, like, the company I work for, I, I don't want to call them, like, co-workers, though they are technically co-workers. I'm not on their team, though, right? Like, I'm not a developer at our company, but I believe we do have a bunch of developers from Spain. So that's pretty cool. I am a developer, but not at this company, right? And I think that's actually one of the main reasons they selected me for this dev advocate role because I am a developer. I can speak more technically than a lot of their, their other like marketing and, and dev advocacy style people, right? So yeah, pretty pumped on it. I'm stoked. You're here from Argentina? Nice. That's the thing that I find most compelling about Twitch in general. You get to meet people from all over the world, right? It's pretty awesome. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, Daruti. Hold on, what's the, uh, before we dig right back into the code again. Having a tried and true dev on the marketing team is huge. Yeah, I believe that for sure. Yeah, um, hold on. Before we get too deep, uh, cable guy uh, quote speech Vietnam. Soon every American home will integrate their television, phone, and computer. You'll be able to visit the Louvre on one channel or watch female wrestling on another. You can do your shopping at home or play Mortal Kombat with a friend in Vietnam. There's no end to the possibility. He, he says it with a lisp. No end to the possibilities. If you haven't seen the movie Cable Guy, you're missing out. It might be the best Jim Carrey movie, and that's a bold statement, isn't it? It's a bold move, Cotton. We'll see if it works out for him. I like it more than Truman Show, yes. Yeah, with a young Jack Black in it, yeah. Maybe I'll take my cable guy. 
I know, it's actually a, a tough thing. It's a tough thing. Yeah. Truman Show's amazing. It's really good. I think Cable Guy beats it. If you want to see, like, young Jack Black, check out a show called Mr. Show. You'll actually see, um... Oh, I'm gonna forget his name now. Oh, why am I spacing on it? Eh, Liar Liar's alright. Yeah. Yeah. Cable Guy's great. Um... Why am I... Let's just do it, right? Mr. Show has a bunch of, like, young, like, people when they were young. So, yeah. David Cross is the name I was thinking of. Young David Cross, young Bob Odenkirk, young Jay Johnston, young Brian Pesain, young Jack Black is in there somewhere, but they're not calling it out. Young Paul F. Tompkins. Right? It's actually really amazing. And it's a sketch show. It was on HBO, I believe. So yeah. Also check out Mr. Show when you get chance. Alright, so we got this stuff installed. Let me just do one of these real quick. Um... I bet we need to restart. Yeah, I bet we need to restart VS Code or the extension host. Let's try that here in a sec. As far as sketch shows go, it's a sketch show. So it's as similar to SNL as Kids in the Hall. Meaning, basically not, <laughs> right? But as far as sketch comedy goes, right? As far as skits are concerned, it is similar in that. So yes, SNL is a series of skits. That's not something that was actually created by SNL. There were shows that did it before then. Saul Goodman, yeah, exactly. That's Bob Odenkirk. And what's up, Suspect? How you doing? Alright, so we're going to do Dune Test Dash W. Uh, let's restart the extension host just to be sure. Things are going good. Yeah, this is my first time trying to write OCaml code. We've been tagging along, letting Dylan Mulroy uh, drive for what feels like months at this point. And now this is my first attempt at driving myself. Driving Chris Daisy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm almost almost positive anyone old enough was definitely thinking about that same one, for sure, that same reference. Oh, hold on, OPAM default right here is wrong. There we go, we switch our switch. That was it. All right. So VS Code has you switch your switch manually rather than what you've set in your terminal, which I, I think makes sense.
Okay, so, um, format, right? Like we just do like an open FMT then, right? Something like that. This is our big old everything in one test. Oh, I shouldn't need to do the uh, the open. Oh. So theoretically, you're talking about like right here, then, right? like doing within the test folder. So, right, like I don't see it there, so I'd have to add format, right? Okay, gotcha, just double checking. Hold on. And yeah, this is happening in the client. No, it's in schedule. Ah, yep, yep. Okay. It's the one that they are talking about is is during schedule active true for hour zero We started doing the 24. This is for active start end single day. Perfect. Okay. So I guess, here's the thing, why aren't we seeing the output from that? Oh, hold on, never mind, this is it right here. Never mind, I see it. So, hour zero, uh, schedule.start is the zero hour of the 15th, which is true. Oh, and this is the output I was looking for, right here. Duh, brain fart. So we see start end. We see start time is basically... Hold up. So a schedule here would be just a number. I don't think we want a date time. We want like the actual like stamp. I'm wondering if that's giving us the issue. Because I would expect this schedule to be printed out with like the integer values. 
So is this a conversion thing, or is it just simply the way the printer is looking for like a like a dot read, or like just some prop to pretty print the date time? Instead, I'd want it to not convert that, and I want to see like the actual like number. Yeah, I think I'd rather keep start end and start time end time as raw numbers in this struct and then evaluate them to date times just during the the functions that need to. What do you think, Dylan? Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they are ints. I mean, technically it's JavaScript, so they're floats, but floats represented as ints. So I understand that, Dylan, but when do I need to do that other than the moment that we're evaluating it? So yeah, we can convert it to a date time whenever we want. But as far as even debugability, the ints are more reasonable and exactly what we're doing with other stuff too. So we, we actually do store like the ints locally. Okay. So just double checking, make, making sure that sounds right. I probably should have pushed back on this previously. I don't think I really understood what was going on until seeing this get printed out though. Yeah, how dare I? Yeah, I think the big thing is like in our test, we're gonna be doing date times because we need to mani mani manipulate the date time. But then uh, like when passing it to our functions that evaluate it, we're gonna end up converting it back to an int to mimic, you know, what we're getting from the JSON. So, yep, all right, that'll be the thing.
I should probably do int 64. I guess here's the question. Would you do it as an int? Or would you specify int 64? I feel like int 64 is more closely modeled on the actual values that are in the JSON. When does a millisecond, or hold on. So that's the 2038 problem. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's 2038. That's going to be the 2038 problem. So I think sticking with... Yeah, sticking with uh, 64 is just more future-proof. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the 2038 problem is the same as the Y2K problem. Yep. My mom ended up working for some companies where, like, they needed to, like, really push to get that stuff done. And hey, what's up, Rython? How you doing? How was the rest of your stream the other night? And you lied. You weren't following me at the time. But it's fine. You do now. So I appreciate you. You've probably been into the stream before. So it's okay. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, do I need to do n64.t? I do. Ah, that makes more sense. Oh, instead of capitalizing it? Okay. But yeah, int64.t or int64 ends up having like all these other methods on it. Got it, got it. Yeah, I'm okay with uh, making it more explicit. Yeah, it makes sense, Rython. Yeah, it's a bummer that there are streamers that are no longer, like, actively streaming. Like, that's one of the saddest things to me. Yeah. And it blows my mind, because, like, why would you ever stop doing this? It's so fun. You get to just work on side projects and chat keeps you motivated. That's awesome. couple of them though like you got to be real careful about cultivating an audience that you like chatting with that's very important you should never have that like moment of do i even want to click the go live button because instead it should be oh man i can't wait to click that go live button so if there's anyone ever in your chat that makes you not look forward to streaming you need to fix that asap because once your like community is tainted you're never going to fix it. In my opinion, it's why Benawad doesn't stream on Twitch anymore. He had cultivated a really toxic chain. I could be wrong. He could totally correct me if he wants. Yeah, I think it's why Star Ansible doesn't stream anymore. He cultivated an even more toxic chat.
There is something to be said, though. Your chat tends to mimic you as a person. So if you end up hating your chat, you need some major introspection. Oh yeah, no worries, yeah, Mulroy. Mr. Sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna keep hacking at it a bit. Thank you for all the tips and the help and getting us started. Uh, we're gonna go through and do this refactor, basically, and probably have to fix a bunch of stuff in our testing and other things. But yeah, thanks for chilling, man. Um, for some reason, he hated Angular a lot. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is uh, him just memeing. Him lacking experience with Angular as well. Right? It was actually asked of him. Have you ever even used Angular? No. Right? That should answer your question a thousand percent about whether it's worth listening to his complaints about Angular. Nope. I think he's cool, but yeah, when he's just trashing a framework, he's doing it for the memes. And that's some of the worst content, in my opinion. Here's the thing, like, he's still never even used it, so he has no expectations because he didn't even try. Keep in mind, there's definitely the, uh, like, this is the, the phrase he used, right? I don't need to jump off a cliff to know it's a bad idea. That is the worst false equivalency to make for that. Trying a new framework is not jumping off a cliff. That's a bad false equivalency. He said that literally in a collab stream with Mutual. Uh, Mutual. Yeah, that's part of my my point about some content creators. The content might be pretty good, but. They are not often qualified enough to make that content. But because they're charismatic, people just take what they say verbatim. And that's a problem. I don't like it. All right, so... I believe we end up needing to do a bunch of the, like, let in stuff. I'm really curious why the in is important. But at the end of the day, I don't actually care that much. I really don't actually care that much. So instead, yeah, uh, date time dot something? Is there a from? Date time of flow? I think it would be like of span. Uh, 
Uh, and hold on. Nope, never mind. We need a value. This is gonna be start. Start date. Date time of span. Um, let's see. That span would then be... Hold on, I need to go look up the date time of span stuff. P time is the library. There we go. So it's like their version of a semicolon. I wonder why in. For some reason, I thought it was more like a thing that passes the value to the next thing after it. Which maybe it is. Right, as far as like closure type like um, like stuff might be concerned. I don't know. That's my guess. Uh, again, I'm no OCaml expert, but I'm enjoying it. Where's Tej when you need? It? I'm writing OCaml myself. If ever there was a unicorn moment, right? Like full on double rainbow, this is it. You actually almost tried to correct me. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um <clears throat> Eval opam env opam switch list. Nope. That's it.
I'm curious why they rely upon the eval. Does anyone know that? Oh, invoke OPAM ENV, right, instead of evaling. Let's see what it does. Yeah, that's a good call, right? So this actually just shows us output. Hopefully this doesn't dox anything. But okay, I get it. So it's a bunch of environment variables, basically, that they're setting for us, and that's why it needs to be evaled. Which, like, by not having the eval, it allows you to then actually inspect what it's setting without the eval. Whereas in other things, you might pass, like, an explain argument to have it just print out what it would do. Or, like, um, maybe not even explain, but, like, sandbox or dry run or something. So yeah, this is to avoid like the dry run flag. I get it now, that makes sense. It's kind of cool. Okay, I get it. Um, let me go use the restroom real quick. I got plenty of water and I'll be right back. Give me a sec. So let's do another one of these. I don't like changing up what I'm sipping on. So we're gonna keep sipping on it. But yeah, this'll probably be... This'll be part of like the forever whiskeys that just sit there for the date that'll never happen and you know as far as like inviting people into my own home but maybe if i ever have guests they can select from things that i don't drink right i'll get some like johnny walker double black or something for people to sip on or maybe uh i don't know some other fancy scotches I know, yeah, I would probably never have a guest in my own home. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Maybe a date, and that's a different thing. That's a way different thing. Inviting a date in your in your own home, you're expecting things to get a little gross. But it's
<laughs> I don't know about that one, four wheel. What are you, a nun? I'm just kidding, I'm having fun, sorry. We don't need to keep it like on this somewhat just n not the right topic. That was my bad. I'm the one who steered it there. All right, so yeah, I guess the main reason I ended up doing this is because I wanted to hop into Utah. I needed that double semicolon. Full on double semicolon. Now hold on, are there semicolons elsewhere too that I just forgot about? Is it like at the end of modules? Oh, yes. It's how you denote the end of a function, etc. Ah. Okay. So, I think the way to think about this is the in operator is still within, like, it's it's how you denote the separation of expressions within one, like, statement, I guess. Or, I, I guess, I'm not sure if this is considered a statement. Within one command, within one statement, whatever. But this is, like, the fundamental, like, block, in my opinion. Right? Like, the, the top-level block. And I'm, I'm sure the terms I'm using here are actually wrong. But at the end of the day, is that just semantics? And understanding in general what this is, is important. So it looks like there's a revised syntax. Interesting. So can you do both? Ooh. So if you want revised syntax, you gotta do dash pp. Hmm. It's definitely, uh... Yeah, definitely like a primogen reference in there somewhere. Or at least like a joke he would make. Heavily. He'd yell it. Yeah. 
dash pee pee <laughs> or whatever, right? Like super loud. Yeah, for sure. I get it. I wouldn't call that a dad joke. Dad jokes are typically safe for work. It's a, the primogen joke at this point. It's a prime joke. It's a totally different thing than a dad joke. I know, I know. I get it too. Oh man, my dad used to sell some awful jokes. Hold on. It's 6.48 p.m. We can do one of them. It's not like they're dead baby jokes. This one's better. This is little Johnny jokes. So, there's a little boy. His name's Little Johnny. He's in kindergarten, maybe first grade. The age doesn't matter that much, but it will make more sense here as we go. Little Johnny comes from a very troublesome home. He swears a lot, and he doesn't even know what a lot of the swear words mean, right? Because he's just heard his parents say. So one day, in class, the teacher's going around talking about the alphabet. All right, kids. Can anyone think of a word that starts with the letter A? And boom, Johnny's hand shoots up immediately because he's a smart kid. He wants to contribute. It's not his fault he comes from a terrible home environment. He's actually an enthusiastic, intelligent, really good kid that just doesn't understand how inappropriate some of the words he knows are. So his hand's just up there. He's shaking, he's shaking. The letter A? Oh man, there's no way this teacher can let Johnny chime in for the letter A. Just, you can't do it, not gonna happen. So she calls on someone else, they say Apple. Okay, great, yeah, exactly, good job. Boom, all right, who can think of a word that starts with the letter B? Oh, little Johnny. Oh, he's got his hand up. Think of all the words you can think of that start with the letter B that are just not appropriate for a kindergarten setting. She starts thinking of all of them in her head. And typically my dad would list all of them because that's part of the fun, like talk, telling it to a young kid as a joke. But anyway, we'll continue skipping over some of them. She keeps going through this entire thing for a long time. She gets the letter C. Oh, definitely can't call on Johnny. His hand has been raised for every single letter until they finally get to the letter R. And she starts thinking, well, I can't think of anything for the letter R. Technically, we can think of at least one, but this is the way my dad told the joke, so we're gonna deal with it. Can't think for anything that starts with the letter R. I think I can finally call on little Johnny. So, little Johnny, yes, what word can you think of that starts with the letter R? He stands up, proud and confident, and says, rat, a fucking rat with a dick this big. That was the funniest joke I'd ever heard when I was little Johnny's age. My dad told me that joke. It's a pretty good one. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty solid. It's pretty solid. Oh, there you go. So that's similar to one of my dad's jokes as well. What's this? And he puts his hand on your forehead, like grabbing it. I don't know. It's a brain sucker. And what's it doing? I don't know. Starving. Right, so he's got his hand on your head. It's a brain sucker. What's it doing? Starving. Because there's no brains. Like, yeah, yeah. It's a good dad joke. Probably not. No, my dad is extremely old. Um, 
Hope he sticks it out, but uh, yeah. He is extremely old. He's lived a good life. If he were to pass, it would be a sad day. But it's gonna happen eventually, right? So, yeah. Sorry to get morbid there. Yeah, I believe my dad is very similar in age. I don't know the exact age because I didn't think that's something kids memorized. I know my mom's over 70 and my dad's older by like maybe seven years. Oh yeah, I don't know if I could say the same thing. Um, yeah, my dad is very, like, quick, but I forget at what age. For me, I was maybe 14, maybe 13 at the time. Uh, he had a cardiac uh, atrial fibrillation, which basically meant his heart did some weird heartbeat thing and then stopped. He was without oxygen for maybe like five minutes before they resuscitated him. When he came out of like the short-term coma, he didn't recognize my mom. And then, you know, over the course of like, you know, a year, maybe a couple years, he started regaining memories. Like remembering the before times and stuff. It was good. But it still like impacted his short term memory in perpetuity. So yeah, long term started coming back, but he wasn't the same person anymore. Like he's still dead though. So yeah, and a lot of the stories he tells are actually true. My mom will be like the the barometer of correctness. She's like, if she knows the story from before the cardiac arrest, then it was then it's actually true. And if he never told that story before then, it's most likely when his brain was recovering memories, he was watching a lot of TV. And some shows ended up incorporating themselves into his, like, memories. So that's the problem. I don't want to dig into too many details, but yeah, there are definitely some memories that are not true, but they feel real to him because of how his brain was recovering memories at the same time it was trying to create new. Yeah, yeah, it's actually kind of like, kind of interesting. I've argued with him a bunch about it. At some point, you just accept it, and he's dead. So, yeah, it's still cool. He's still got awesome stories to tell. He's a good storyteller. Sometimes, they might not be true. Exactly. For sure. Uh, wait, what's up, Demise? It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a good, uh, there's a song called Pets by, um, Porno for Pyros, I believe. Yep. Yeah, Perry Farrell, the singer from... Oh, why am I spacing on their band name? Jane's Addiction. Perry Farrell was the singer, and the song called Pets is super just chill and awesome. There's a lyric in, in it where it's like, uh, like, we'll make great pets for aliens is basically like the gist of the song. We'll make great pets. There's a line where it's like, 
Children are innocent. Teenagers messed up in the head. Adults are even more messed up. And elderlies are like children. Right? So, like, we kind of just go through this, like, phase of getting back to where we were. Which is, I actually think, why Benjamin Button is so, like, actually, like, relevant. It's a good, like, thought piece on, like, yeah, no matter what, you're starting and ending in a very similar state. Flipping it doesn't actually change that much. Yeah, it's a great song. I really like that song. But yeah, what's up at infinity, Mr. Sir? Yeah, how you doing? We're enjoying a nice chill Thursday. I probably need to get more coding done. Let's do it. We got some good stuff done already today. What are we doing? You probably want to check out Vexilla. We're working on the OCaml SDK for Vexilla. Uh, we just did two commands for you. I would say check out the output from that, uh, Nightbot there. I'd say please read the links that Nightbot provided when I did the Vexilla command there. And then if you have questions after checking out some of that stuff, I can answer. But doing the entire elevator pitch right now for one person that hopped in, now we got code we want to do sorry yeah no worries yeah please if you read those and then have questions i'm more than happy to dig in and, and get more specific but to do the entire like educational aspect of what feature flags are and all that stuff i'd rather not do that right now if we got a big raid then yeah i'd do it for a big group of people but for one person at a time as people hop into stream i'd never get any I hope you understand. I appreciate you. Thank you for getting it. As long as you do and you're okay with it. All right, so of span D. That's a bummer demise. I'd say some of those conversations, we can wait till like a better stopping point, if that's okay. You'll recognize those moments. Um, but I'd kind of like to get some of this code done. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate it. Like, I get you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you felt comfortable enough to share it. So, thank you. Um, but yeah, like, I don't want to dig into a big conversation about that right now. Maybe later. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've seen you in other streams. Maybe it's been this one, I think. I don't know, let me double check. You've chatted in here before, actually. Right. You have. Yeah, back in 2023. Gotcha. I was wondering why uh, why your name looked familiar. That's all.
Might be other streams I know you from too. So yeah, just curious. But let's actually do this part. need to create a span got it and then that's really like the type uh, ml um, this is OCaml that we're doing I forget what ml stands for though but yeah the language we're dealing with is OCaml it's in the title Yeah, yeah. So I knew, like, ML was actually, like, it was its own language at one point, and now it kind of just describes a family, right? Yeah, incre incredibly influential. What does ML stand for? <coughs> Meta language or something like that? Meta language? Cool. Uh, no, Objective C is actually not that bad. Come on, man. just chill. I won't tolerate negatively talking about languages without a technical constraint, and saying function calling is hell is needlessly hyperbolic, right? It's not hell. It's actually not that bad. Good editor tooling makes it. So, just saying, Demise, we're not going to get into language wars. I'm not going to tolerate anyone saying anything negative about a language or a framework without a very specific technical constraint to it. And what you just did was not specifically technical. So I need to just bring in this span module. is not what we thought it was. So library span is no good. Technically doc core 
This is the Jane Street stuff, so they have their own like standard library, so that could be an issue. So it's P time of span span. Of float S. Got it. Right, right. So that's maybe the way we want to do this. So we have to turn it into a float and then we can do of float s. So really like this of yo json Okay, so instead this would be let from MS, right? And hold on. And this is a named parameter, right? So that's what the tilde does. Okay. So from ms
Aha, so we end up wanting something kind of like this. So I messed that up. I don't want to do the T part. And right, because it's the um, Hindley Milner or whatever, I might not even need to specify the type. I think I need the match statement. Syntax error. Oh, so match JSON there. No, I get it. So I don't need that. Yeah. Okay. Right, and then that's where like the let at would be necessary. I'm not sure the order we do these in is necessary.
All right, so module schedule. So that person's not getting the none value out of it. Oh, wife has COVID? Oh man, Bob, that's a bummer. Yeah, yeah, tend to your wife, man. Uh, what are we building? The thing in the title. What up, bad man? How you doing?
What a... How you doing, Shirawi? What you up to? Oh, really? Yeah, it's a good theme. If you're a streamer, you can get Stream Parrot right now. It's going well, running into some typing issues, but that's on my end. So instead of int 64, what if I just leave it as int? Because I think it's worth it just to get things working right now. And then we can always dig into making it better. So I thought let at That's all LWC stuff, right? Double check this isn't like a VS Code extension issue. Yeah, it is not. It's a nested result because of something I'm doing, I think. We're seeing a lot of like option to result stuff.
Hmm. Yeah, anyone got any thoughts here? What's up, Skydriver? Mr. Sir. I think the big issue is that ah, I bet I wanted to do this. I think that's it. That is still a result. If we do that, then why are they yelling, right? Because that is a result. Yeah, where is the bull coming? This should actually be working. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm getting pretty hungry. And yeah, I want to dig more into this. We're going to keep working on the O-Camel stuff tomorrow. And maybe Saturday if we don't make a lot of progress. Woo. I'm getting tired because I definitely didn't get enough sleep today. So yeah, we're going to head over to Gaming Stream. Let's go raid somebody first, though. Who's streaming right now? 3.30 a.m. where you're at? Yikes. That's way too late. Um, who's even going right now? Oh. Eh. I need, I need their permission to raid them, so I'll have to ask them at another point, because we're not doing it today. Um, the Coppinger? Coding with Strangers. Yeah, for sure. Pi Day. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I will be doing more OCaml tomorrow, so yeah, come and hang out. Um, but yeah. I'm just, I'm getting hungry. I want to play some games, and I probably want to, like, get some, like, early sleep tonight, because I got to wake up pretty early tomorrow. Yep, let's go raid. Coding with strangers. He's a good dude. If anyone wants to hang out over on my gaming stream, it's gaming. We're probably going to watch like an episode, maybe two, of Red vs. Blue. And then we'll hop into some game. Maybe Persona 3. Maybe uh, Dragon's Dogma. I know there was something else I was thinking too. Maybe Last Epoch. We got options. We'll figure it out. But okay, I gotta eat some food first. So, I will see most of y'all here tomorrow. I'll see some of y'all over on gaming. And uh, at least a bunch of y'all should say hi and chill with Coding with Strangers for a little bit at least. 
So yeah, I'm gonna click that button. We're gonna go right on in. Uh, let me end the YouTube stream first. So yeah, people on YouTube, thank you for chilling. 